So thanks for allowing me to be here. Um, I'm a big fan of New City Church for a number of reasons and have been a fan uh, for a long time. It's uh, for a number of reasons. I, one is we just experienced. I love the music here. We've never been able to attend. I love the number of tall people per capita, <laughs> tall brothers. Like, uh, you know, is literally like this church is tall. So uh, I appreciate that as a tall guy. And uh, I appreciate Gabe and Carrie. I think you guys already know this, but you have some really special leaders here in addition to the other leaders, but you guys are blessed. So uh, again, it's a privilege to be here. Delighted to see this church begin and begin to establish roots here in Oakland and the East Bay. And I really do love seeing the culture and community that God is building in this church. And I really, really mean this. I cannot wait to see what God has in store for this church's future. Uh, When Gabe reached out and asked if I'd be able to speak on the topic of the crucifixion of Jesus. I was kind of at one level honored, and I was excited, and I was terrified as well. Uh, this doesn't always happen to me, but, you know, sometimes you get a message, and you're just like, oh, man, I, gotta, I don't want to mess that one up. Uh, I was excited again because I love this church. I love being able to give Gabe uh, a week off of preaching so he could enjoy time with his family. But I'm stressed because the crucifixion, the cross, and the resurrection uh, of Jesus are the most important parts of the Bible. They're the parts of the story that we can't get wrong. Uh, Paul, who was an early leader in the Christian movement, he wrote a letter to a new new church uh, in the city of Corinth, and he said this. This is 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 4. He says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. What Paul is saying here is that the most important truth that he ever taught this new church and the most important truth that he himself was ever taught was that Jesus was crucified for our sins, that he was buried and he rose again, and that all of this happened according to the scriptures. So we don't want to get this wrong, okay? I don't want to get this wrong. If you're a Christian or you're interested in the Christian faith, you don't want to get this wrong. The crucifixion and the resurrection are at the very heart of the Christian faith, And if you believe in them, they're not only the hinge in which all of history turns. The crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus are the foundation that you're going to build your life upon. And so if you are new to exploring Christianity, there is nothing more important than studying these topics. And so I'm excited to be talking about the cross and the crucifixion today. Gabe will be covering the resurrection next week, Easter Sunday. I really do hope that you guys bring uh, friends, people in your life that you know um, might want to or need to come. Uh, But again, I am a little bit nervous because I know the stakes are high. Um, I grew up in Phoenix, Arizona. I think you guys ever been to Arizona. It's a hot desert place. But I went to college in the Midwest, in Missouri. And uh, aside from a very short trip, like I barely remember when I was a small child, I'd never actually been to the Midwest. I'd never been... Like, I'd been to, you know, I'd been to California, I'd been to Mexico, but I'd never been to the Midwest besides from some time that I don't really remember. And so when I went to college, I was going to this college in Missouri, and I'd never even done a college visit. My family didn't have a bunch of resources. I wasn't like a prime student or something with lots of options. And uh, when I showed up for college, everything was new for me. There's a lot of things that I experienced and I saw that I'd never seen before. And I can remember vividly this ride in a, in a car uh, from Tulsa, Oklahoma, to this small college I'd be attending in Missouri, uh, and I was blown away by the grass. The grass, okay? Far as the eye could see, like bright green grass growing in fields, in, on hills. Uh, grass was everywhere. Like, there was grass all over the place. It's like this, similar to the kind of grass we have in Northern California in the spring when the hills are just popping with green. And again, I grew up in Phoenix in the desert, and grass doesn't grow naturally, like, at all. Like, it's never grown there without effort, okay? Uh, You had to fertilize it. You had to water it. Um, In Arizona, people actually have, like, two kinds of grass. They have, like, a a winter grass, and then they have a summer grass, and you plant them at the same time because one of them's going to die. Like, when I was a kid, I just remember chore after chore having to make grass work in my family. Like, oh, cut the grass, water the grass. I think it's about the grass because our lawn was never good. Uh, I played soccer growing up, and I can remember vividly uh, that we would have games that were canceled because it rained. Not because it was too muddy, not because there was like too much water, but because if we played, we'd mess up the grass. <laughs> this is really true. We would ruin the grass. Grass was a luxury item where I lived. And so I was absolutely amazed by the grass that seemed to just pop out of the ground everywhere uh, without any effort when I went to the Midwest. So when I went to my college campus for the first time, I'm stunned by the grass. I'm just like, how rich are these people? 
They just, it's grass, it's just everywhere. And, you know, I talked to this with, like, other students, they just looked at me like I was out of my mind, like, it's just grass, man. Like, it's just grass, okay, dude, what's the big deal? They'd grown up around grass their whole life, they'd seen it, and so it wasn't amazing to them. You know where I'm going? Here's a concern I have, uh, especially for those of us who have a background or who have experience with the Christian faith, that we've seen crosses on buildings, in art, on necklaces, maybe in our own homes, maybe we've worn them on our own bodies. We've heard the story again and again, and consequently, we might just have become numb to the significance of the cross and the crucifixion of Jesus. We've stopped being amazed. And so here's my simple plan today. I want us to examine the seven statements that Jesus made on the cross. These are the seven things that he said recorded in the four Gospels that we have in the Bible of the words that Jesus spoke while he was being crucified. Uh, I believe that these words were carefully chosen by the Gospel writers to teach us about the meaning and the significance of what happened when Jesus died. And my hope and prayer would be that looking at these final words that Jesus said, that they will remind us, or maybe even help us for the first time, see what the crucifixion means for our world and even for our own lives. That, that as we read these words and re-examine them or read them for the first time, that they will amaze or re-amaze us. That is my prayer. All right, let's jump in. A little bit of context, in case you're just walking in off the street, what are we talking about? All right, Christian faith teaches that Jesus was born 2,000 years ago to a virgin mother, Mary. Jesus was fully human, but at the same time, fully God. He was the fulfillment of many prophecies. He was a promised king. He was a Messiah that they were looking for. And the Jewish people, they were expecting this person to come and help them and save them in their time of need. And so Jesus, he grew up in Israel, and he likely worked as a carpenter before becoming a traveling teacher and rabbi, a miracle worker, who challenged the religious establishment of his day uh, with his teaching, with his claims about himself. He was a controversial figure. He gained many followers. Thousands and thousands of people came to hear him teach and to see him heal the sick. People would bring their loved ones to hear Jesus, to experience him, to be healed by him. And what's even more incredible is the Bible teaches that Jesus lived a sinful life, because he was a man, he was tempted just like we are, but he was at the same time God. He was morally perfect. And with both of these dual identities, he modeled for the world what it meant to be fully human, to live the way that God created us to live. Jesus' life, his teaching, his ever-growing popularity, his disrupting of the, of the religious or power systems of his day, it made him an enemy of many of the Jewish religious leaders. He was a threat to their power. And so these religious leaders um, betrayed their own people and they conspired with their own oppressors, their colonizers, the Roman political authorities, to arrest Jesus for claiming to be one with God, to be God. And this totally offended the Jewish religious leaders. That, that was, it's a monotheistic religion, so for a person to claim some kind of unity or, or, or be God, it was just very complicated and that was an offense to them. And they brought this to the Romans because Jesus also claimed to be a rightful king of the Jewish people. And this offended the Romans, who considered this a challenge to their king, Caesar. And this was something that together they deemed worthy of death. And at that time, crucifixion was a brutal form of capital punishment. We're not going to go into all the details of that. Uh, but it was basically a form of torture, uh, to torture someone being killed that the Romans used. But, but it was quite a bit more than that. It wasn't just like, what's the most violent way or most painful way we can think of hurting someone? Uh, it, was, it, was, it was used as a kind of a public teaching tool by the government. Okay, it was, it, was to, it was to teach and intimidate the wider community about something. So people, when they were crucified, their bodies would slowly die over hours and hours, often multiple days. And these crucifixions, they happened in very public places, like on major, like, of a path, like where people would walk or take horses or whatever. Uh, and this was for all to see. And so for the Romans, crucifixion was sort of a way of saying, you know, hey, if you steal, don't steal, because if you steal, this is what's going to happen. Don't murder, because if you murder, this is what's going to happen. Don't oppose our laws, because if you do, this is what's going to happen. Submit to us. Crucifixion taught something to the people who witnessed it. And what's really interesting is Jesus just inverts their intention. Many lessons were taught in Jesus' crucifixion, his public execution to a watching world, says a lot of things, but it's not what the Romans or the Jewish relig religious leaders expected. 
And so I hope as we examine the crucifixion today that we might gain some lessons in a, in a, in a bitter irony to them that we would hear and see something about Jesus that maybe we've never seen before. So let me read the story, begin the story, where we'll find the first of the seven statements that Jesus makes. Uh, this is from Luke chapter 23, beginning in verse 32. I'm going to go like all over the Gospels, and so if you're like a Bible opener, which is totally cool, you're going to be like disappointed, because uh, it's just going to be fast and furious. So everything should come up here. Um, don't feel like you need to follow along, but if you want to try, go ahead. That's fine. Challenge, challenge accepted. Um, so Luke 23. Two others, who were criminals, were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him, and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Hang on to that. That's the first statement. I'm going to keep reading. And they cast lots to divide his garments. And the people stood by, watching, but the ruler scoffed at him, saying, He has saved others. Let him save himself. If he is the Christ of God, his chosen one, the soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, if you were the king of the Jews, save yourself. And there was an inscription over him, this is the king of the Jews. The Romans were trying to teach something, and Jesus, as he was mocked on the cross by the religious and political leaders, they were trying to tell the people something. They were saying, is he really God? If he is, why doesn't he save himself? If he's really a king greater than Caesar, where is his army? Why doesn't he have anyone to save him? And this is the limited perspective of those on the ground in the world that could only see Jesus in contrast to their Jewish leaders and their Roman world. It's like the people that are on there that only see Jesus in relation to an earthly kingdom. They're only seeing that moment, that perspective from sort of like a, a two-dimensional lens. Jesus, though, knows that his death is part of a much larger and more significant story than just upsetting religious leaders in Israel and threatening the ego of a Roman Caesar. Much more is happening. Much, much more is happening. Much more is at stake than they could have ever imagined. And our first statement, again, that he says, number one, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. In a myriad of ways, they don't know what's happening. In these words, Jesus, he brings an entirely new dimension to this situation, to his crucifixion. A new reality begins to emerge. We now see that there is a Father God observing, even judging the actions of the participants. There's something cosmic or spiritual happening at the cross, and incredibly, Jesus advocates on behalf of those who have planned and are now crucifying him. They don't understand what's going on. They don't fully realize what they're doing, and this doesn't make them innocent. It only reveals how much they don't understand about their actions. One of my favorite uh, pastors and theologians is a guy named John Stott, and he said in this book, it's called The Cross of Christ, if you're looking for a book that you're like, I want to learn about the cross, this is the best book that I could recommend, honestly, one of the best books I've ever read in my life, uh, The Cross of Christ by John Stott. It's about the meaning of the crucifixion. He says this about the cross. Before we can begin to see the cross as something done for us, we have to see it as something done by us. Everything Jesus says on the cross has an implication. Not just for those who were there when he spoke and he was crucified, not just to those who heard him that day. There's an implication for each one of us as well. For it's not just the religious Jewish, the Jewish religious leaders, the Roman political authority uh, that, whose actions led to Jesus' death. The Bible teaches us very clearly that each of us actually contributed to that moment. Our own actions, you, me, everyone in this room, had a role at the cross. As one of the prophecies in the Old Testament says about the Messiah, this is Isaiah 53, 5. I'll read the first half of that verse. It says this, But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. I want to pause there. I'm going to read the second half of that verse in a moment. There's more to it. But I want us to recognize that the crucifixion wasn't just something that other people did to Jesus a long time ago. It wasn't just something that happened to him. No, we did something as well. While we were not physically present in that crowd that watched or mocked Jesus, I really do believe that we were all there in some way. Our sins, our actions, our disobedience, our lack of, of uh, righteous behavior that go against God's design for us as humans contributed to the need for Jesus to die. And this feels like bad news. And you guys are like, yes, it does. It feels like very bad news. 
And it is. But if we don't see ourselves there at the cross, just as much as those soldiers who uh, mocked, those rulers who mocked, those people who quietly watched, those who even nailed him to the cross, if we don't see ourselves there, if we don't recognize our own faces there in that story, we also can't be recipients of Jesus' words here, where he asked the Father to forgive. We have to recognize our guilt before we will rejoice and personally apply Jesus' words, Father, forgive, not them, but us. For we didn't know, but now we know what we have done. This is how the cross and the crucifixion begins to become good news. Um, there's, I, throughout this message, it's like so frustrating because they're like, I'm talking about these like huge, deep things, and then I'm like, and we're moving on because there's just a lot of stuff. And so know that we could talk about each one of these items for an entire day. I know that, you know that. Um, sorry about that. But let's continue and look at the second statement Jesus makes on the cross. It can be found in one, if we keep reading this in Luke's gospel, uh, picking up in verse 39, let me read it for us. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, this is Jesus speaking, number two, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. So much could be said about this interaction between these two criminals with one another and with Jesus. But let me just note one thing first. We see here that not everyone who observes Jesus on the cross finds his death compelling. The first criminal, here's some people, uh, what they're saying about Jesus. And, and I should probably just maybe say this from the beginning. Uh, generally speaking, like in the Roman world, like you had to be a fairly significant um, do something pretty significantly wrong. They're called robbers sometimes, but this is most likely people that would have uh, attacked vulnerable travelers. It's, these, these guys have done some gnarly stuff, is what I'm trying to say here. Um, but, you know, the first criminal, he, he, he has a very interesting perspective. You know, he hears what people are saying, and he comes to Jesus with this almost like entitled attitude, where he basically is like, Jesus, like, if you're God, why don't you save us? Like, why don't you do something for me here? Isn't that what you're supposed to do? Isn't that who you say you are? It's, it's really interesting to me the like, degree of, like, he feels entitled to Jesus helping him for some reason. It's really interesting. Uh, and it, it just reminds me um, of a woman that my wife once had a friendship with. We, we knew her, and she had some understanding of the Christian faith. She didn't understand any reason, though, why God would have any right to tell her what to do. She enjoyed, this is like 20 years ago, she enjoyed coming to church uh, sometimes. She appreciated the community to some degree. She had like a certain comfort in thinking about a God who loved her and would care for her, but she had no sense of sin or guilt for anything she did wrong. So when she'd like cheat on her husband or any number of things, her attitude was basically like, I don't care. I don't know why God cares about what I do with my life. And if he cares, isn't it his job to forgive me? Like, isn't that what he's there for? So why, what's the big deal? My job is to live my life. God's job is to forgive me. And it's very much like the spirit of this first criminal. Jesus, do your job. If you are who you say you are, save me. But you contrast that with the second criminal who sees the situation very differently. He has this sense of personal guilt for his actions. He recognizes that they, these two criminals, are actually guilty. They're like fundamentally different here than Jesus. That they're deserving of some kind of punishment for their actions, and Jesus is being punished even though he's guiltless. There's an injustice happening to Jesus, and they are being punished for their crimes. Remember what the second man says. I'll read what he says again. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward for our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. It's fascinating to me that this guy actually makes a similar request to Jesus as the first man. He asks the man to remember him, to save him as well. But the heart behind the second man's request is so radically different than the first. I mean, it's like could not be farther. It's the heart of a humble person, not an entitled one. 
It's someone who trusts and believes that Jesus is who he says who he is. Jesus isn't having to prove something to him. He's like, yeah, Jesus, when you come into your kingdom, assuming that that's going to happen, then will you help me? It's the heart of someone who's been broken over their own sin and recognize that they need help, not that they deserve it. And in response, it's amazing, Jesus begins to show us how grace works. He shows us how God responds to the humble who come to him, believing in him and asking for him to help them in their time of need. It's, it's, a, it's an image of the gospel. And I love Jesus' words, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. This guy does like nothing besides come to God in humility and faith. And Jesus promises, today you will be with me in paradise. So much more could be said. We're going to keep going. I'm going to read the context of Jesus' third statement on the cross, this time from the book of John, chapter 19, verses 26 through 27. John 19. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. So our third point again, third thing Jesus says, woman, behold your son, and to the disciple Jesus loved, behold your mother. In the middle of all of this that's happening, it feels like a bit of an aside or something, right? Like, man, some heavy stuff's going on, and Jesus is just like, hey, mom, you know, something's going on here. Hey, friend. Uh, Jesus sees his mother. He sees his best friend, one of his best friends, the author, actually, of the, of the gospel that we find these words in. Someone who, when the other disciples had abandoned him when he was arrested, John actually stays with Jesus and his mother to the end. And the whole encounter is like very interesting for a number of reasons. Um, because on one level, it's just, it's just interesting because it would have been absolutely necessary for someone like Mary to have like someone to look after her. In that society, she's uh, already thought to have lost her husband, uh, Joseph, already. And she's now going to be losing her eldest son, Jesus. And so it's not a surprise that Jesus is like thinking about someone taking care of her. But what is surprising is that Jesus assigns these words to John. Uh, and, and why that's surprising is because Jesus has a bunch of brothers. He has a family who would have had a, like a, just a, a moral and even almost to some degree a legal obligation to care for their mother. And so it's really interesting. Like, what is going on here? Why is Jesus doing this? Which is basically what he's doing with his words. He's basically saying, hey, you take care of her. She, you guys are now a new family. And, and we know actually Jesus' brothers, one of them actually becomes a Christian, at least Christian leader in the early church, wrote the book of James. We also know, though, that Jesus' brothers didn't initially believe in him. Uh, John chapter 7, verse 5 says this, not even his brothers believed in him. And so who knows? Like, it's just interesting to think about. Maybe Jesus, his teaching, his claims of uh, being God fractured his family for a season. Maybe Mary chose to follow Jesus, and this came at a high cost to her relationship with her other kids. Who knows? We don't really know. But what I think is happening, here's my suspicion why the gospel writers include this, why John includes this, is that I think with these words, Jesus is showing us a picture, a glimpse of how he wants his followers to care for one another after he's gone. Jesus has already said in, in, that his followers are like a new family, that whoever does his father's will is like a mother or a brother to him, that followers of Jesus are to love one another, to care for one another like a family. And so what part of what Jesus' crucifixion accomplishes, and part of why I think these words are included here, is because it, it, the cross enables a new kind of relationship between people. The later New Testament writers, like in the letters, they talk about this all the time. In the, way, the same way that kind of sin disrupted humanity's relationship with God, separated us from God, sin causes us to be separated from one another. And for some of you like, that may be like, I don't even really know about sin, at the very least, we can all see how sin, with sin, how, why sin, what that is, why does that mess us up with God, maybe that you have questions about that, but we can at the very least see how sin separates people from one another. Think about jealousy, greed, racism, violence, theft, betrayal, cheating. These are things that very clearly divide people. But Jesus' death not only addresses that vertical sin barrier between us and God, it also begins to address the sin that divides us from one another. And I think that what we're to take away from this is that we're supposed to bring in the same spirit that we see in that second criminal because of the cross. And, and to bring that into our relationships with others. And, and where we can come not just to God, but also to one another in humility, recognizing our guilt the ways that we have hurt other people, and we can seek reconciliation with one another. Moreover, if we've been hurt by others, which we all have, 
we see in Jesus an example of how we too can offer forgiveness to those who sinned against us. At the cross, we find not just an example, though. I think this is really key if you have issues with forgiveness. We actually find at the cross, when we meditate on Jesus' death, the motivation to forgive. Not just an example of how to do it, but the motivation to do it. For we begin to see ourselves as also having been forgiven a great debt. And it's only when we see ourselves as having been forgiven a great debt that we actually have the motivation and like the tools to begin, I think, to really forgive other people who've sinned against us. Uh, there, there's so much more here, like I'm barely scratching the surface on some of this stuff. I hope you have questions and you talk to Gabe or Carrie or Jalisa or anybody about this. Uh, I hope you join a small group and you guys talk through how does this all work. Um, and, and I just want to also say, we see so many examples of Christians failing to live this out, failing to live up to this kind of new family. Um, but I, but that, that Jesus is starting here with Mary and John, but at the very least, I want you to see Jesus' intention. Jesus' intention here, while he's dying on the cross, it was that important, he spoke about the need for his followers to care for one another, to treat one another like family. All right? Okay, we're going to keep it moving, and we're going to look at the fourth, fifth, and sixth statements that Jesus makes kind of uh, together. We're going we're gonna to kind of package these ones together. So we're going to go through a number of them. I'll kind of go back over them, and then we'll talk about some implications. So let's read the first one of this group from John chapter 19, verse 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scriptures, number four, I thirst. I thirst. The humanity of Jesus is on full display here as he cries out for something to drink, as he declares his need for something, but it's even more than that. Let me read the fifth statement Jesus makes, which we find in Matthew chapter 19, verse 46. In about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Number five, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Something more than just the humanity of Jesus is on display, but more than just an injustice being done to a righteous man is on display. Something is happening between God the Father and Jesus, his Son. Between God and himself. So let me read the sixth statement Jesus makes in John's Gospel. This is chapter 19, verse 29 and 30. Uh, begins, and then the statement happens. It says, a jar full of sour wine stood there, and so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch, and they held it to his mouth. And when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. Number six, it is finished. So we have, I thirst. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It is finished. These three statements, we see a few things. First, we see that the crucifixion was something that was not just a random event. It's something that God anticipated. Multiple things are happening during the crucifixion uh, that Jesus says or that he does that are happening to him are said to happen in order to fulfill Scripture. We just even read that earlier. We, we just read that if you, uh, um, Isaiah 53 uh, it was written hundreds of years before Jesus was born. Now let me read you a couple passages from Psalm 22, see if they sound familiar. This is Psalm 22, verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Later in this same Psalm, verses 15 through 18, my strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death, for dogs encompass me. And a company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. This psalm was written before crucifixion was invented. What happen, is happening to Jesus on the cross is something foretold in advance by the earliest writers of the Bible. It's really not too much to say that from the first book of the Bible, uh, the book of Genesis, and throughout the Old Testament, we find hints and promises of this time when God is going to save his people, when a great king is going to come, when a sacrifice is going to be made that will save the people from their enemies and from their sin. Uh, has anybody here read like, the Jesus Storybook Bible? Do you guys have that? Do you guys like, pass that out to parents? Okay, if, everybody go buy the Jesus Storybook Bible. It's so good, okay? Even if you, like, if, you, if you were a kid, if you're thinking about having a kid, go get that book. And it has this amazing uh, subtitle. It's like a little book full of stories uh, about Jesus. And the, the subtitle is Every Story Whispers His Name. Every Story Whispers His Name. And here's the reality, it does. The stories we find in Scripture whisper and point us towards Jesus. 
Uh, Fleming Rutledge, she's written in her book, The Crucifixion, from beginning to end, the Holy Scriptures testify that the predicament of fallen humanity is so serious, so grave, so irredeemable from within that nothing short of divine intervention can rectify it. You see, the Bible slowly paints a picture, story by story, stroke by stroke, that shows the need for a Savior to come. It's almost like the Bible is painting this picture, and if if any of you are familiar with the concept of negative space in art, it's like the space between like the primary objects in the piece. So like if you painted two people, like there's a head, there's a head, the space between them is called like negative space. Sometimes it's blank, sometimes it's something else. Um, So you have these kind of like highlighted points of the composition and then the space between those. And in, in music, as well as in like visual arts, like the space between the notes is just as important as the notes themselves, as the paint themselves, okay? And, and what's it's really amazing is that in all of the biblical stories, in the negative space in the Bible, we see the cross. It begins to unfold in this beautiful way. The poetry, the prophecies, the sacrificial system, the kings, the laws, everything is being put on this canvas. And in the negative space between it all emerges, and we realize that the true object of this painting hidden in that negative space and now revealed in Jesus on the cross is Jesus crucified. God substituting himself on our behalf for our sin. It's why we can study the Bible forever and always see something new. It was put together by a master artist to point us towards this moment we're reading about, towards this man, this God, Jesus, crucified and resurrected. And so there's nothing more, nothing more valuable we could do than, than reflect on this for our lives and the implications for every relationship we have, every action we take, every decision that we make. What is Jesus doing on the cross? Uh, the second observation I want to make from these three statements, I thirst, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And it is finished. Is just simply that Jesus took our place. Jesus took our place. He took my place. He took your place. Why is Jesus forsaken on the cross? Why is there a distance between God, the Father, and him? It is because he stepped in to the place that we belonged. He took our place. While we are like the criminals who deserve to die, Jesus takes our place. Romans 6, 23 says, the wages of sin is death, but the gift, free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. This is a hard truth, one of the hardest truths most of us wrestle with. Do we really believe that the, well, the thing we deserve for our disobedience to God, for not living the kind of human, humanity with one another that he designed us to live, that the, the right result of that is death? Jesus died so that we might live. The one who was like living water. He described himself as living water, the kind of water that if you drank, you'd never be thirsty again. He became thirsty on your behalf. The one who knew no sin became sin so that you might become the righteousness of God. The one who created life became death so that you might live with God forever. This is the good news of the gospel and the Christian story. John Stott, he says this, at the cross in holy love... God, through Christ, paid the full penalty of our disobedience himself. It's amazing. It's amazing. And so when Jesus says it is finished, he meant it. He finished it. There is nothing left to do. He has done it all. He did this for you. He did this for me. And he offers this to to the whole world. And so... How do we respond? That's the natural question. I hope hope it is, and I hope it's something that you reflect on this week. And and we see this in Jesus' final words on the cross uh, in Luke chapter 23, verse 46. These words can be seen as kind of a model response for us. So if you're going to do a takeaway here to the cross as you think about this week, this is what I'd love for us to all do. Jesus' uh, last words on the cross, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Into your hands I commit my spirit. It is a declaration of dependence and trust in God and not ourselves. Not our religious righteousness, not our wisdom and intelligence, but in him. Jesus gives himself over to God. He commits and entrusts himself to the Father, and that is the choice that each of us has today and every day. 
as we reflect on the death of Jesus on the cross. And it's something, again, I hope each of us thinks through this week. Today, as I go into the world, will I commit my spirit to the Father or to something else, to myself, to the world, to some, some image of me that I'm supposed to be, or will I give myself to the Father? Will we be those who passively watch, who mock and scorn, who come in entitlement, or will we be those who come in humble faith, recognizing our own guilt, our own sin, our own inability to save ourselves? Will we entrust ourselves to the Father? Let's pray. God, I really am amazed by the work you've done on the cross, that you've saved sinners like me and sinners like each person in this room, all of us that have fallen hard in ways that we're embarrassed by, in ways that we're ashamed by. God, you have raised the heads of so many people who've been downtrodden, who've been discouraged, who've been depressed by their sin. And so, God, I pray for each person in this room, God, that we would grapple with our own need for you. And God, that we would look to the cross, we would see the example of Jesus, his death on our behalf, and that we would commit ourselves and our spirits to the Father. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.